What, what is the it's Dickens? It's not entirely anyway? unlike the Dickens of the Wind. I don't even know. Yeah, what is the Dickens and how is it a measure of anything? This is the fun tech where we talk about hardware and all that crap. Maybe we'll talk about something else that's fun. A lot of fun things are happening. Like we're about, we're about to climb a mountain, Wendell. Uh, you know, we, we talked about this like a year ago. I wanted to climb a mountain and play video games on top. And I wanted to do it in August of this year, but we're not doing it in August of this year. Everything got ruined by Linus and his team of bastards. Let me get serious right now. We, we've, um, we, we talked to as many different YouTubers as possible and Linus and Tech Syndicate, Linus Media Group and Tech Syndicate are actually the two you know, that are working together to spearhead this thing. And what we're doing is we're working with Asus. So thank you very much, Asus. And we're working with Intel. And we are also working with Corsair. So those companies looked at this and they were like, you guys are gonna go play video games on top of a mountain. You guys are crazy and we love it. So thank you guys very much for uh, hooking us up and making this all possible. Without them, we wouldn't be able to, we'd be, well, actually we do it on our own, but it would be very low budget like a bunch of guys up there freezing to death. Anyway, so we got together. <laughs> it's going to be the uh, wilderness. Yeah, it's going to be out in the and middle of nowhere. Isn't it, isn't it possible that we're going to break a world record, maybe? So we talked to Guinness. It could be the highest altitude terrestrial land party ever. So we've got Paul from New Egg coming. We've got uh, Kyle, I believe, is coming. We've got um, Elric is going to be there. So um, a lot of people are going to be climbing this mountain, and a few others that I'll re uh, that will remain unnamed right now because I want I want some surprises. Austin Evans is going to be there. I'll, I'll give you guys that one. But a few more surprises are going to be there as well. Uh, Linus invited some people, and we're just going to go climb a mountain and play some video games on top, break a world record, and you know I'm also going to give away an ASUS gaming laptop. How about that? I'll give away a gaming laptop. Everybody will be happy. And stay tuned for some really epic content. Uh, we're going to be doing some video blogs. Aren't those called vlogs? I don't do those. We're going to be doing some, like, on-the-ground videos from the day before. And then we're going to, you know, give you guys a really epic video of what happened on the summit. So that should be a lot of fun. And it's coming up very soon. And, again, thanks to our sponsors, Asus, Intel, and Corsair. You guys are awesome. Thanks very much. Now, yeah, the, the crazy thing is that there's no road to the top of this mountain. If you're going to carry this crap to the top of the mountain, it's going to be on foot. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I don't think everyone's going to make it. I really do not think everyone's going to nope. make it. So we at least we two have, of you have to make it in order to make a land party. <laughs> yeah, it'll be it'll be tech syndicate at the top. All the rest <laughs> take that as a challenge. So I'm I'm kind of worried about clever people editing. It's like people yeah. at the bottom of the hill and just edited <laughs> together and it's like yeah it's totally happening at the top of the hill no <laughs> it's like some guys clapping and it's like was that a hotel room they're just clapping like a, what the hell they yeah it's it's gonna be Are 30 gonna degrees see Go ahead. a thing on the news where it's like the forestry service is like yeah we had to send in the rescue helicopters <laughs> you know those things cost ten thousand dollars those rescue helicopters ten thousand yeah. dollars that's I should probably weird. give all the other YouTubers a disclaimer right now because I haven't spoken to all of them yet, but there's a disclaimer and we're not responsible. <laughs> all right, let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about technology and, and, and technology news. Uh, should we talk about a little bit of Computex before we get into everything? Some of the stuff you guys yeah. may have missed. Let me, I'm going to open up some a, of our videos we, real quick. Yeah, there have been a, a bunch of hardware videos from Computex, so we'll just take a, if you might have missed them, we'll just take a minute to plug those because they're pretty awesome. I'll go ahead and tell you which ones are, are my absolute favorites. Um, the, the one we released today, uh, Asus Tour, and you guys will be watching this video tomorrow, but check out, I mean, ASRock, you guys know who they are. I'm sure most of you guys do not know who Asus Tour is, and a lot of you guys are going to be like, Asus Tour? Is that a division of Asus? No, it's not. Um, it, it's an Asian company, and they make a very interesting NAS that has some very interesting hardware that can do everything from... Oh, um, it can do everything from surveillance to XBMC. It even has an, uh, an HDMI output. Very cool little devices. Um, let's see, Thermal Tank has a ridiculous 540 millimeter radiator. Uh, that's kind of crazy. Uh, SanDisk was showing off an SSD, and you, this is going to pique your interest, Wendell. An SSD with, uh, it's like 550 and 560 read and write. It's like unbelievable. It's like something stupid like that. But it also has a 10 year warranty with the SSD. And it's, it's not, um, this is not like, you know, an enterprise grade thing. It's, this is a consumer grade drive that they're selling with a 10 year warranty. So that's wow. pretty crazy. Um, and when, if you guys want to see some Albert videos, Albert was actually in a few videos. He, uh, 
was kind of freaking out over the uh, the in-win case that's there. Uh, Asus had a ridiculous amount of cool stuff. You know, uh, that's just too much stuff. If you, got, if you guys really want something nerdy, check out the Noctua video. We got really nerdy with Noctua, talked about some of the design technology that goes into their stuff. And if you guys look at the comments on some of these videos, especially this one, people are like, whoa, I had no idea that they put that much into a fan. I'm now a fanboy. So, yeah. <laughs> a fan of so, the fans, you would say? <laughs> yeah. Big fan of the fans. Anyway, so there, I, think we, I think we've plugged our videos. Let's talk about Google. Google has just purchased a satellite company, uh, Skybox Imaging. Now, Skybox Imaging, uh, they created the world's first high-resolution HD video of the Earth. I'll go ahead and play it right now because it's kind of cool. And Google has, has picked these guys up. Now, this company, I mean... They're known for you know imaging, right? But they also, they're a satellite company. Google could do a lot more than just imaging with the satellite company. I mean, I can immediately you, you look at this and you're like, oh, I can see all the implications for what they can do with this technology as far as Google Maps and Google Earth goes. But I kind of want to take a step farther and, and talk about what they could possibly do with a company that's in outer space. Think about satellite internet. Think about you know, spreading internet to all the people who currently do not have internet. Google right now is at a point where I think they are looking to expand, I guess, their audience. And the, everyone's on Google. So the only real way for them to expand their audience is for them to get new people on the Internet. So I don't know. Do you think this is something they, they could use to possibly spread the Internet? Well, I, one of the things that has been speculated is that this may be a network of satellites. So there was an, uh, a long time ago, there was a, a satellite network <coughs> called Iridium that was going to bring satellite phones to the whole planet. And so we built those and we launched a lot of them, but uh, Iridium didn't make it, basically, as a company they went under. And so Google may be doing something this similar, but with internet connectivity technology and things like that. Unfortunately, I don't think this technology is going to support a super high density of satellite receivers and satellite also has a terrible latency. Now, the satellites that you have like with Dish and DirecTV that provide internet access, those are geosynchronous satellites, meaning that they never move. This is a net this is potentially a network of satellites that are in a much lower orbit and so the latency will be better, but the latency still wouldn't approach a wired latency. Right, That'd but I mean problem. Even if the latency is not there, I mean, it's not going to be used for gaming, but this could be used, I mean, in my opinion, it could be used for, even if it's used to beam, you know, the internet to a box somewhere in like the middle of Africa or whatever, and then that box distributes internet to the village or whatever. I mean, then it's one connection yeah. coming in and then that box is distributing it. I don't know. I'm, I'm always could, looking at it, Google and thinking that they're trying to expand their audience. They could totally do that. I mean, that, that, would, that would maybe be an option like yep. regional connectivity that otherwise has no connectivity at all, at least until something better could get in there and the market would support it. Yeah. So that's interesting to keep an eye on. Lowe's has decided they're going to create a holodeck-like room for customers to try out. Now, it's a lot of, uh, I guess there's a lot of articles like this floating around on the internet. And it seems to me from reading the article that they're not actually creating a true holodeck, so it's maybe a bit sensationalized. Uh, you know, they're taking a cue from Star Trek is, is the, you know, that's the leading line here. But it seems like if you read it, it's a hollow room is essentially a 3D augmented reality. I'm not sure if they're actually going to be projecting things into the room as much as they are going to be uh, giving you th tools, whether it's a, like an Oculus Rift type thing or if it's a tablet where you can look at a wall and then see the actual physical item as if it were there. They're also going to have an app where you can do this in your own home. So, it's I mean, this is, I've already seen some holodeck. things like this. Yeah. I mean, you guys can look at the bottom here. It's really but, my dream um, come true. There it is. They're building, a, uh, there it is, their, their hollow room thing. One thing that I thought was interesting was that this is kind of a, maybe they're thinking from a strategy standpoint, a gateway to get people to come back to brick and mortar retail stores. Because if you can find it on Amazon, you don't have to go outside people in america are like that's amazing i can just hit a button and they'll bring it to me so lowe's suffering a little bit well i mean you know the next step on this because you know the people here in the video they're just walking around with a tablet looking thing in their hand and they're they're seeing things that aren't there i mean really what's to stop amazon from creating an app just like lowe's has created an app i mean hell 
Fractal Design has a really awesome app that allows you to pick up your tablet or your smartphone and see a, you know, a computer case or whatever product on a table. You can like position it there and like there it is. It's like there it is. So I mean, Fractal Design has already done this. Why is it such a big deal now, now that Lowe's is doing it and why is everyone treating it like they're actually creating a holodeck? It's not what's happening. They're creating an augmented, it's an augmented reality app that a lot of other people are doing. So it's, in my opinion, not that big of a deal. So, I don't yeah, I would agree with that. Maybe I'm being overcritical, but it's been done, and <laughs> well, it's it's the, we're in the unfortunate position that we know how the magic works, and so it's like, oh, this really <laughs> isn't that big of a deal. There's a guy right here under the table handing you rabbits. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, uh, they're like, shut up, kill it, kill this person. All right, let's talk about DARPA. Speaking of um, of magic, DARPA says it's working on the Z-Man pro, uh, program. Now, the Z-Man program essentially is going to allow someone to scale a wall. Um, they're working on something called Gex Skin, and they're using the technology that geckos have. Geckos are just such <laughs> so technologically advanced. <laughs> they're basically using uh, what, what geckos have, because geckos, they can scale just about anything. I mean, so can spiders and stuff, but they, they can go right up the side of a glass wall. So the idea here is that uh, this technology is going to allow you know, uh, a 220 pound man plus 50 pounds to scale up the side of a glass wall. That's pretty crazy. Now, what's even crazier is this technology has been around for a while. They've just released this to the public. They invented this a couple of years ago, apparently. So we're going we're gonna to have yeah. robots with this technology is the next thing. Go ahead. Well, it's, uh, it's, it, it, I mean, I think it's just going to become part of like the urban warfare standard kit. It's like, <laughs> You know, here's your special gloves that let you, you know, scale a glass skyscraper or whatever. I mean, think about that. It's like it's not really jungle and desert warfare anymore. It's, you know, uh, urban warfare. And so it's like, oh, you can just put this on and scale a building. And they mentioned that, you know, the demo, somebody had actually already scaled a vertical glass whatever, and it worked fine. Yeah. You know, I, they seem like they're taking a lot of cues from... Um well, from this is they're they're obviously saying it's like Spider Man. I'm not sure if that was the the cue that they took for this, other than the fact that they just wanted to scale a wall. Uh, but I mean, a, you know, a lot of this stuff, a lot of technology that's coming out takes cues from Star Trek and from science fiction novels and that sort of thing. What I want to see that's not out right now. You guys could take a cue from uh, Star Trek. Which episode is it? Number five, I believe, or maybe it's number six, where Spock has the uh, the boots. Is that Star Trek five or six? I think it's five. He has the the, uh, the rocket boots. I would love a pair of rocket boots, guys, if you guys could get on that. Make it a lot easier oh, to get to the top of that mountain. It was four? You're talking you about sure? the one where uh, Kirk is climbing with no safety gear and he falls off and Spock has to save him? I, I thought that was five with the, the, the whole, like, they're searching for God and they get thrown in the brig. That's the one where they got thrown in the brig. It's five. Maybe maybe it is five. Cause remember I they thought get, it was... What's his I name? Spock's, the of Spock's the brother. They saved the whales. No, it's Spock's brother. Spock's brother shows up and throws them all in jail. Then Scotty blows them up, blows them out of jail. Then they're climbing. It's got to be five. That was like well, one of the no, worst that, ones too. That does happen in five, but I think when they broke out, they were on the uh, the Klingon prison thing. So I don't think Spock would have had rocket boots. <laughs> so, you know, someone people are furiously typing in the comments right now. You <laughs> idiots! It's actually three. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. This military technology, it's like, we're working on Spider-Man. It's like, I'm pretty sure they've already made Green Goblin, and he's already <laughs> loose in the world. <laughs> <laughs> UFO sightings over Sedona, story at 11. Uh, <laughs> it's Green Goblin again. Uh, let's talk about Elon Musk. There's been a lot of interesting things going on with Elon Musk, and a lot of people have been posting these memes online that say, good guy Elon Musk. Is he really doing a good guy type thing. Let's talk about exactly what's happening. So he has opened up Tesla's patents to all. That's a very broad uh, subject there. Why do they always do this? It makes you click on it, I guess. It, it's not exactly that. What's happened is Tesla has said, hey, we're gonna make a lot of our core technologies open source so that anybody can make a similar car that refuels in a similar way but that that's pretty much the end of it. I mean, it's sort of akin to saying, okay, let, let's go back 100 years and say that like Ford, right? They put a patent on uh, a, the, a car that could be refueled at a gas station, right? And then Ford says, hey, you know what? We're going to allow everyone to use the same technology that, that, that can allow their car to be refueled at a gas station. Or yeah, I guess you could go even a step farther and say, we're going to allow other companies to develop 
a box with an engine and wheels. Right? Yeah. That's pretty much what Elon yeah. Musk is saying, unless I'm off. And, you know, this is not all of their patents either. This is, I mean, we're not going so far to say is that the patents that they opened up have no commercial value, but the patents that they have that are the most valuable are their battery patents. And so, like, Boeing re really needs that battery technology <laughs> for their Dreamliner because they keep having problems with the batteries on those. And, we we uh, flew yeah, on, like, they, two or three of those over the, over the last couple of weeks. I, I didn't even the, know that that was scary. But, yeah, we were on a few it, of those. It's, it, I mean, the batteries are, I guess, pushing, like, five, six years old in some cases. And some, there have been some battery fires. And Musk apparently was brought in as an expert to, like, look at it and deal with it. But uh, he's not letting those patents out. It's really around things that could be considered, you know, standards for electric cars. So by releasing these, if people actually use them, it's only going to further Tesla's interests. Well, you know, BMW has been meeting with Tesla about, you know, using some of Tesla's technology in their cars. And a lot of other car companies are looking at Tesla. And it seems like he's trying to pave a way to make electric cars more of the norm. Because right now it's like... It's Tesla and then a few other weird stuff that's proprietary and different. And, and he's trying to create a world where you can drive around and be able to refuel your car anywhere. That's completely smart business for him because as the well, industry grows, he's going to grow. Step, step back and, and look at this at, like not as an oil-blooded American. Right. And, uh, you know, okay. So electric cars, why don't we have them – tomorrow what are the advantages over an electric car if you have you looked at a mechanical diagram of a tesla the motor is tiny it's it's basically uh an overgrown like the size of an overgrown differential gear at the rear of the vehicle it's a very small motor in comparison with the amount of of motor motor that you have in a typical like a four-cylinder vehicle the yeah, braking you, system the electrical system all of that is very much i mean it's high technology but it is less complicated than what we have in a mechanical car, if you will. Well, you say this is high technology. This was invented by uh, Nikola Tesla like a gazillion years ago, and anybody can use it now. The patent is in, has expired. So anyone can well, use this technology, right? That's true. The engine, the Just concept, the engine. And, the, and the whole nine yards were, were, uh, are very old. But it takes modern manufacturing techniques and modern manufacturing tolerances to get the efficiency. The real problem with all electric cars everywhere are the batteries. The energy density of a bat, like I, the energy density of gasoline is crazy, the amount of energy that's in there. And the energy density of a battery is much, much lower by comparison. And batteries can't wait to catch on fire and blah, 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 and Tesla's <laughs> mitigated that. If we had an amazing battery technology that was safe and you could somehow convert gasoline directly into electricity, Think about like man with manufacturing ramp up. So we know another industry where something like this has happened, and that's CRT monitors. You remember like the big giant CRT monitors that were crazy. We're, we're going to fire electrons at a mat, or and it, we're going to you know convert it, and we've got a vacuum tube, and then it excites photon or uh, excites uh, phosphor on a, a oh, yeah. uh, on a glass surface. Those that's are like crazy. the two hundred pound ones that we used to get out of the trash can at banks. <laughs> like, hey, let's go dumpster yeah. dive it at the bank. Like, I had a 200-pound monitor. It's 20 inches and amazing. Think about a modern LCD monitor. Now, a modern LCD monitor has way less components and is way easier to manufacture. But when LCDs first came out, they were much more difficult to manufacture because techniques hadn't been invented and production hadn't ramped up and blah, blah, blah. But a an LCD now is less rare earth minerals and less resources to manufacture than the CRTs of, of the days of yore. And so we're in a situation like that with electric cars where someday with the battery technology, electric cars are gonna be insanely way cheaper to manufacture than mechanical vehicles because mechanical vehicles are fundamentally more complicated. The only reason that they're more expensive right now is because all the manufacturing and expertise is in that. I'm gonna boil this down and make it simple. This is not a good guy Elon Musk move, even though it is a very good thing. It's a smart guy Elon Musk move. So that's, it, it's it really is, smart for the industry. I mean, it could potentially benefit his competition, but it only furthers the industry, which furthers their interests. So that's a fair statement. It's a, it's a, it's a smart guy move, I think. We need, we need a I smart so guy too. meme. Somebody make a smart guy Elon Musk meme or something.
instead of good guy. I don't know. Good guy Greg is too stoned to get anything done. I want his 3D Any- titanium printer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about Mozilla for just a minute. They've got their uh, smartphone that's going to be coming out uh, somewhere toward the end of the year, and, and they're saying it's going to be a $25 smartphone. The specs are not going to be miraculous or anything like that, but the bottom line here is this is going to be a $25 smartphone that will give you much of the functionality of Android minus all the apps. The core functionality will be there. You know, you can browse the web. You can send text messages. Uh, you know, there'll be a few apps for different things, music apps and just that sort of thing. And more apps will come. But it's interesting that they've priced it at $25. They've realized that the market right now um, is really saturated. And it's going to be very difficult to get someone to either switch from the really fancy, you know, $400 Android or iPhone or whatever. Uh, it's going to get, be difficult to get them to switch. And it's also going to be difficult to find new customers in that, you know, high price bracket. So what they're doing is they're going to be creating completely new customers, just like what Google was doing earlier. They're looking at expanding markets and new customers, people who need a first smartphone or people who haven't upgraded in five years and they're finally ready. To, wow, I haven't upgraded in five years. Man, <laughs> this may be my new phone. If the, if the <laughs> OnePlus One, you know, keeps getting delayed and all that nonsense. So yeah. But yeah, I just think it's kind of interesting. I'll, I'll definitely be following the the progress of the of the um, the Mozilla phone. What's what's what else is funny is uh, now you can actually run the Mozilla uh, apps apparently on Android. They've already come up with a way that you can run them on Android, so you can run all five of those apps now that I probably already that are redundant. A bunch of industry analysts are sort of on to the whole race to the bottom for dumb phones or whatever. And I, I don't, I'm not really sure what's behind that. I mean, for developing markets and emerging markets, $25 smartphone is amazing. Even in America, I mean, you know, two hundred more than $200 for a smartphone is, is asking a lot, especially if you can get most of the job done with a $25 or $30 smartphone. And, you know, the teardown on construction on these cell phones, typically the components that go into them really aren't that expensive. So I, it's good that these are becoming more and more inexpensive, not just for the third world, but also domestically. But I don't know that there's really a driver other than an economic one. And a lot of the analysts are saying, people just want a phone that's an amazing phone. And I, you know, when the iPhone came out, it was kind of like that. It's like, oh, it does, it does, phone, it does the phone function really well. And a lot of other smartphones that were available at the time really didn't do the phone function. They, they did everything, but they didn't do anything well. And the, the iPhone didn't do a lot, but the things, the original iPhone didn't, didn't do a lot, but the things that it did do, it did well. And so I'm not really sure why the analysts are jumping on this whole, you know, the first one to come up with a $25 phone is going to be amazing. And, and one of the things that they think is, that it's going to be like is that you've got the, you know, the old Nokia, like the brick phone that's like $25 that lasted like 10 years. They're somehow equating the $25 phone with like the 10-year Nokia phone. And it's just never going to be like that again. No, it's, I can't imagine that they'll be able to produce a $25 phone that will be able to, to, to compete as far as, you know, the build quality goes either, so... I mean, I, it'll sell because it's 25 bucks. Hell, I might buy one to play with, so. All right, let's move on and talk about, um, I guess, some hardware type things. Uh, IBM has sold their, um, their, their chip business to global foundries. So there's gonna be a lot of interesting implications. For the first question in a lot of people's heads is, is what's gonna happen with the power PC? Is IBM getting out of that business? Or are they gonna contract with global foundries? I don't know, do you think that IBM is sort of taking a step back from their, uh, you know, their chip business and maybe they're gonna focus on services? They've been moving towards services and, and selling off a lot of different things. So they're, they're really focused on services, but uh, do you think the power PC is dead? That's my first question to you. Well, no, they, they made PowerPC, the architecture, easier to work with. Google was working on some uh, PowerPC architecture that was something totally custom, and they're letting people do more stuff with it and, and that kind of thing. What this, what's really happening here is that the fabrication 
stuff. The way that the semiconductor industry has worked forever is, you know, global founder or TSMC or global founders, somebody comes up with some amazing new process and the people that have the most money get that process. But what happens to the old equipment? What happens to the prior generation equipment? Well, that's sort of sold down the river. And, you know, tech, fabrication technology that was originally used in the 80s is still in use today. It's just being used by very small fabrication facilities or university fabrication facilities and things like that. It is not unusual to see 30-year-old, you know, silicon mask equipment being used at a large state university or things like that that, you know, went from Taiwan to Costa Rica to somewhere else to, you know, back to Taiwan and then to the States and then from the States to Mexico and then from Mexico to somewhere else. Because, you know, being able to make microchips, it turns out, is a handy thing. That, that equipment is long-lived. But with modern stuff, with graphics cards and processors and things like that, you know, the benefits that you get from die shrink, which are mainly power saving and you can pack more stuff on silicon, everybody wants that faster. And so in order for everybody to get that faster, we've got to centralize the fabrication facilities so that you've basically got one or two people that always have the most modern equipment. And there's less of a benefit for companies using older fabrication technologies because they've got more heat and more power and things like that. It also unlocks designs. We're to the point where we can do so much in such a small area that heat really is a problem. And if you've got a design that doesn't work at, you know, 28 nanometers or 32 nanometers or, or whatever, that probably would work at 18 and 22 nanometers, then, you know, that's a thing that you've got to look at commercially. So IBM's just like, uh, we're not going to do this anymore. Global founders can deal with it. Yeah, they're only at 22 nanometers on their, uh, I guess they've got a couple different factories, one's in, in New York and one's in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, but yeah, they're only on 22 nanometers there. So it's not the latest generation as far as the die shrink goes. But I mean, I guess they could be retrofitted and upgraded. Uh, that, I mean, it's, go ahead. It's, it's, it's weirder than that because like Intel claims that they're on 18 nanometer, I guess, but Intel oh, measures 14. slightly different or 14 nanometer, but uh, Intel measures slightly differently. So, I mean, people always comment on that that are, that are in the know in the industry, but basically at a high level, what we're saying is accurate, but the particular foundries that are doing particular things with 14 nanometers and 18 nanometers and 22 nanometers, you know, Intel's got an experimental fab up and running somewhere in the southwestern quadrant of the U.S. that supposedly is doing 14 nanometers, but I don't know if the features really are 14 nanometers. They've showed off laptops that they claim, it's like, this is a die shrunk Haswell, and it's 14 nanometers. Woo. Yeah, we saw some of those things uh, in, you know, in, in Taipei. So, anyway, uh, let's move on. Speaking of the new Intel processors, let's take a look at... Um, Devil's Candy now. Uh, do you have any Devil's Candy yet, or do we do we not have one? I, I have not purchased one myself, but um, you can't actually get one unless it's an engineering sample. So we've no, got a retail Devil's Canyon forty seven ninety that should be here between the twentieth and the twenty fifth, but everything else at this point is pretty much engineering samples. Yeah. So there's some so interesting articles some floating around. Ha Haswell refresh. Uh, uh, Haswell refresh Pentium, and we've got some interesting gaming benchmarks coming up with that. Now, what's interesting here is Hard OCP was able to test out the uh, 4790K, and the highest overclock they were able to achieve is 4.7 gigahertz at a 1.36 voltage or volt core. That's that's really high. That's really that high. Pretty high. So, I it's mean, a that's 700 kind of megahertz lobby. overclock. Yeah, and we've seen, of course, 4770Ks. You had a 4770K that would go 200 megahertz higher than that on two cores. Uh, the other two yes. cores were at, at 4800. So. No, it's uh, 4.9 on two cores, 4.8 on the other two. Yeah, that's 4. what I was saying. 4.8 across the board. Yeah, oh, okay, 4.8 okay. across the board, yeah. So, I don't know. We'll have to see some more, but it looks it looks to be similar hit and miss as far as the overclocking potential, but it does look like generally you're a couple hundred megahertz above the last generation, but it's almost the same part, guys. It's really, really almost the same part. I have been yawning a lot about this. I do like what they're doing here, but I've been yawning a bit. I'm waiting for the new 2011 CPUs and I'm waiting for the next true, you know, the, the true next generation. This is like an in-between kind of, it's weird. So, I mean, if you- This is a very much an in-between. You know, if you haven't upgraded in a long time and you're ready to upgrade, there's no reason to go for the 4770K if you can get a 4790K for the same price. There's absolutely no reason. But if you already have a 4770K and you have to have more speed, you're gonna need to go socket 2011. And that's just the, the that's the way of things, okay? All right, what else we have to talk about here? And DDR4. Yeah, DDR4. That's going to be out. It's a 2011-3. 
by the way. Mm-hmm. It's by, not backward compatible with 2011. So, <laughs> <laughs> Time to buy new everything. New RAM, new motherboard, new CPU. Aren't you glad? All right. Thanks, Intel. <laughs> Let's talk about Focus Fusion. Um, this is kind of blowing my mind right now because, you know, Fusion is, that's what everyone's been after for a long time. And, of course, you... The, the, the fusion, the fusion that has a you know a, a net positive as far as the energy goes, well, we haven't really been able to do it. We've we've been able to blow up stuff with with fusion. We're very good at blowing things up, and I feel like a lot of times we get funding whenever we can blow things up. But there's a company here in New Jersey called Focus Fusion, and they're claiming that they have cheap, clean uh, fusion power on the way. But this is going to be in small packages. How, how nerdy should we get about this? I'll let you get a well, little bit nerdy with this. I worry about okay, so the physics of this is pretty solid, but I worry that this is a little bit snake oil because there's another kind of fuser called a Farnsworth fuser, and that is fusion, but it's not very efficient. It you don't get as much energy out of it as you put into it. These guys say they've got a theoretical design that looks like that they would be able to produce fusion with it with it the problem is that it's a fundamentally different kind of fusion than has been worked on for the past 40 years so what are they doing well <laughs> what else kickstarter yeah so that's, see that that's the thing that weirds me out and like a lot of the articles online are saying this looks really legit this could be the thing you put one of these in every neighborhood uh and it uses some of the i guess They've they spent billions of dollars trying to figure out fusion. The government spent billions of dollars. And uh, this uses some of the problems that they have been trying to, to avoid. And I'll, that, I'm trying not to get too nerdy here, but as you can see here in the video that's on the screen, um, it, it, they're using some of the, the things. Well, I'll just, just watch the video <laughs> that's on the screen. Uh, it's it's so much easier to say. There's not a it's lot also, of scientific detail about what they're doing, which is bad. But... The principle is sound theoretically, and they're not really asking for a lot. So uh, well, they claim that they've for the doubt and see what happens. They've, they've they've claimed that they've already done a few different things. They've already hit the temperatures needed. Like we're talking billions of degrees, which hotter than the sun. That's several times hotter than the sun, I believe. So they were able to achieve this, and also there's pretty much no radioactivity once it's done. It's it's a very safe reaction. You can walk right into the chamber after the reaction is over, and no harm will come to you. So. Well, it's, that's because the radiation by or the radio radiated byproducts of the reaction are typically are mostly X-rays and ions, and we can capture X-rays and ions and convert them directly to electricity without much headache. Whereas, like you know, the other kind of fusion is mainly around producing heat and using the heat to boil water to drive steam turbines, which this is not that. No, it's totally different. That's fission. And, uh, you know, there's probably going to be someone in the no, comments. No, it's, that's, it's, that's that fusion, fusion, too. Is it? Yeah, I mean, the the uh, uh, the tokamak uh, fusion thing is mostly producing heat to drive steam, just like a fission reactor, but it's fusion. And that's oh, okay. magnetic confinement fusion. And that's, and that's the one that's pretty damn dangerous. Yeah, and we've been working on it for 40 years, and it's like, it's not working. <laughs> People keep exploding. <laughs> All right. Uh, warp drive. Uh, yeah, this is just fun. At this point, we're just having fun. <laughs> NASA's warp drive. Oh. So there's some really awesome pictures floating around the Internet about a theoretical warp drive. Um, and that's pretty much all we have at this point. Is It's, it's a lot of theoretical stuff here that possibly could uh, work. We've, we talked about the actual science behind this several episodes ago, so I'm not going to get it, back into that again. But it's, it's called the we, Enterprise. We can, it's interesting. We can sum it up. And it's it's literally if we if we knew a way to compress space in front of this vehicle and expand it behind it, it would travel along this warp bubble, if you will, uh, at a superluminal speed. Now the ship's not actually moving faster than the speed of light; it's just compressing and expanding space behind it. But of course, you know whoever came up with this works for NASA, and of course. In the, in the concept diagram, you know, all the computer panels use L cars, which is like Star Trek. And, of course, it's <laughs> named Enterprise. So, yeah. Let's, let's let Indiegogo this thing. I mean, come on. Let's just, let's just get it over with. Even though we don't have any idea how to build something that will compress space in front of us and expand it behind us, let's just go ahead and do that. I'm telling you, if you want to get this thing funded, go to Congress. Say, listen, we could blow up the moon with this thing. And they'll be like, oh, how much is it going to cost? I'll write you a check right now. <laughs> 
Like, sure. No, we've Done. we've already said we've already. It's like to the scientists in the audience. All you have to do, it, it needs to be this big scientific conspiracy where a bunch of scientists get together and say they found oil on Mars. Like Mars's core is made entirely of oil. We will be there tomorrow. <laughs> it's so sad. Oh God! Um, <laughs> or the asteroid belt is made out of oil. If you're really ambitious, I don't know. <laughs> like, cause, yeah, cause, because all the dinosaurs that died there, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <coughs> all right. Um, oh God, this is going to be a terrible topic to talk about. Vermont getting sued over the GMO labeling, and um, this ties in because this is science. I mean, this is the progression of science right now. Genetically modified organisms—that's biology, that's science, that's experimentation, and that's also. Uh, you know, moving forward in the future, it's going to be something very important. And if any of you guys have followed me on the internet, you know that I am pretty for the labeling of GMOs. But I want to have a got a conversation where you guys aren't calling each other names and yelling and screaming and calling each other hippie and like whatever else. But I don't know if that's possible on the internet. But all all I'm going to say <laughs> nope. here for the labeling of, of GMOs is that you know Monsanto is my big problem here. And the reason I'm, I've got such a problem with Monsanto is, I, is that throughout the years they've done so many things that I, now I don't trust them. And so they're behind a lot of the GMO stuff. There's actually some good GMO stuff going on out there. But it seems like Monsanto, a lot of their research is specifically for the purpose of maximizing their bottom line. And they do so by sabotaging farmers and doing all kinds of things. And, I've, and I'm sure I'm going to get into a lot of arguments with people out there who are going to vehemently disagree, and that's totally fine. Um, but I am not against scientific progress. I just need to say that because I always get blamed of being against scientific progress and like people are like, you of all people are against scientific progress? No, I'm just, all I want is a label on there so people can make a choice because the, stu the seeds are, have a patent because they're so different that they require a patent, but the actual products are not different enough for a sticker. Now this is an uber complicated um, thing. I mean, even right now, the, the, the definition of GMO is kind of, it's kind of a uh, hazy, if you will. Like, I mean, stuff that was, I guess, uh, bred, like, you know, like crossbreeding and sort of that, that may fall under GMO, even though it's just crossbreeding, you know, you take two different things and you put them together. And I mean, like dogs, are dogs GMO? I mean, really? Well, I mean, that's, that's something Monsanto has done to conflate the issue, too, because it's like, well, if you want to get technical about it, you know, everything has been genetically manipulated. But right. there's, there's something fundamentally wrong and, and fundamentally evil about, you know, selling farmers a crop and they can't, you know, reuse your, their seeds year over year. That's, that just doesn't seem morally okay for some reason. Um, and you know the the problem is where do you draw the line with the labeling because a lot of the a lot of the people that are critical of the labeling are like you know where do you draw the line exactly and I don't I don't know where the line should be drawn because there's so much um, manipulation of reality and so much disinformation that's been spread about this because Monsanto potentially stands to lose a lot of money because they've got everything wrapped up so tight. But, you know, being able to grow your own food from seeds that you have or that you've purchased, and especially the situations where, like, someone else's seeds have blown onto your property, and so na nature is just taking its course, and, and then you're Monsanto is like you're using patented seeds, that I, somehow that has to translate to the consumer to where the consumer can discourage that kind of behavior at a corporate level. If that's food labeling, fine. If that's something else, that's fine. If it's government regulation or transparency into what they're doing, that's fine. But people need to be able to look at that corporate behavior and have some kind of a mechanism to encourage those companies to not behave so mm, psychopathically. There's a very interesting article here on The Atlantic and I would recommend that you guys go over and take a look at it. They talk about some of the myths, and I don't think they hit everything perfectly on the head. But, you know, they, they go in and cover um, stuff like um, uh, Monsanto and the other seed developers are the main beneficiaries of G, uh, GE crops. That's a myth, and they go in and talk about why. Um, but, we, but we know that they do benefit quite a bit from the seeds. Um, uh, the G, GE crops are, are environmentally sustainable. That's one of the big arguments that, that, I, that I've heard. Um, but you guys could, you know, could go and just take a look at this article here. 
it, it will give you some some pointers, and I'm sure you guys could start Googling all day. I've had such a hard time, and I even met uh, uh, you know a cool guy in uh, Taiwan. Kip, if you're watching, what's up, man? And we had some interesting conversations about this, and he sent me some information uh, as well. And uh, you know, his it seemed like his biggest uh, point as far as the labeling goes, he was worried that people without any information, do they just blindly hate GMOs? That they're the reasons that labeling need they're that they're the they're the main ones who are for the labeling, and he didn't want to label just just for them, you know, just for these people who don't have any scientific knowledge of what's happening. They're just the the, the loudest voice in the room screaming label. So I can see that as well, but I'm still for labeling just because I like anybody, whether they're educated or not, to know what they're buying. So I don't know. I want to know what you guys think about all this. And I'm not against, again, like I said, not against scientific progress, but, you know. We struggled to come up with an analogy that would make sense, but it's like, I mean, if you're, if you're I, I, you know, it's like, I love meat. Meat is delicious. But, you know, I know where uh, it's like, in order to eat this extra delicious food, we have to torture a duck and make their liver fatty, which your liver becoming that fatty is very bad, you know, to in, in animals. And it's like, I don't think I'm going to eat that particular food. There, okay, like there's, if, there's someone right now sitting at home just eating foie gras with a, foie gras with a spoon. And, and he's just <laughs> going to be like mouthful, like, and you just made him feel funny. <laughs> well, it's like we're torturing a duck to do that. And I don't, that's, that's maybe, I mean, you, you need to know that. And you don't have the same transparency a lot of the time with, with, uh, with food that has been genetically engineered or genetically manipulated. And there is a distinction between the two. So it's like, I, you don't necessarily have that with steak either. I mean, maybe that, you know, there's somewhere that, you know, tortures cows for the extra delicious cut. But if I knew that was happening, I probably wouldn't eat it. <laughs> well, you also say the difference in genetically engineered and genetically modified, which is a key difference. You know, like a lot of stuff you said, like it has been, it's like two different types of corn are put together to make a corn that is m more resilient. But, you know, the other, the other side of this is they take corn and they take, you know, Roundup or whatever sort of either weed killer or pesticide, and they basically genetically modify the seeds so that that is in the seeds. I, I kind of want to know that. That's a bit weird. I mean... I haven't seen any studies that say that's safe or not safe, but that I don't know if I'd want to eat stuff that has pesticides in the seed just because I'm a hippie and I hug trees and I'm, you know, an idiot and you can't build your nuclear power plant in my backyard. <laughs> that type of thing. <laughs> but you know what I mean. <laughs> anyway, I think I'm ready to move on from that. I think I think I'm being reasonable. I'm sure there's a lot of you out there who want to justify your lifestyle, whether it's one way or the other, who are going to yell at me. But can you try to see the middle ground, people, somewhere? Anyway, it seems like a lot of things that are done in the interest of bottom line, you know, uh, in the interest of the bottom line are done without the most sincere intentions. And then that's where problems come in. I am totally for completely awesome science that's not motivated by the bottom line. So anyway, moving right along here. The Earth may have underground oceans. We're almost out of time on my on my uh, camera. So uh, I'll probably go through this pretty quickly. But. Uh, some scientists, they, they were staring at the, the from Northwestern University. Uh, I guess the, Steve Jacobson was the actual person here. But anyway, um, he's, he's been looking at this. And the, I guess we've been talking about this for a number of years. But uh, in his research, he believes that there is actually six times the amount of water trapped in ringwoodite, which is a type of water that's very porous. But it's, you know, uh, what, about 400 miles. Type of or, rock. Rock, yeah, yeah. What I say? Wood? Water. It's water <laughs> that's very porous. It's it's like, I don't think that's a thing. <laughs> water. Very porous water. <laughs> yeah. I've got a water container to hold my water. Um, and it's, but it's too porous. And it all, I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. So anyway, it's about 660 kilometers or 400 miles down. He believes that there is tons of water. And also that kind of changes the theory. A lot of people think that a comet hit the earth and that's where a lot of the water came from, you know, an ice comet or something like that. But now if there actually is all this water under the earth, it may have, uh, that's, that maybe is where the oceans came from. It may, it may have just like seeped through. I believe it's sort of fresh water though. So I don't know. It, it is not mentioned in the article, but it is interesting. Perhaps the uh, geologists can weigh in here, but the uh, thermal, the depth of the ocean is such that the 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 depth of the ocean is basically the optimal point for thermal transfers in terms of like transferring energy from 
the surface to the core or to the to the the ocean bottom or something like that. I read a few years ago, and um, it was to do with you know how they would expect to find oceans on on other planets. But the depth of the ocean just happens to be the optimal depth for some sort of thermal convection type situation. And they talk a lot about that, but not from the ocean part, but from like the water and the rock part in this article. So I wonder if that guy's aware of that and has read that, and perhaps a geologist can can weigh in and be like, oh, this is what you're talking about. If you do weigh in, please do so on the website. We're way more likely to see your comments on the website than we are on YouTube. Not because we do look at the YouTube comments here and there, but there are just so many of them. And a lot of them are like, hey, I have a butt. <laughs> and that's the end of the, I mean, that's, that's pretty much the whole, the Welcome whole comment. Welcome to YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, let's keep on moving here before I run out of battery on this thing. Cause I'm out of batteries guys. I forgot to charge them after Computex, so yeah.